Good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to this webinar hosted by uh, Norwegian People Say, together with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Normally, I would say I'm glad to see all of you. I don't really see how many you are, but I know oh yeah, I hear we are quite a few people here. Um, first, I just want to mention that this event is being recorded. Uh, it is also being streamed live on Facebook as well as here on, on Zoom. Um, and yeah, I can also mention that my name is Magnus Flake and I work as an advisor here at the head office of Norwegian People's Aid. Um, I will just have a short introduction about, uh, about what's going on in Cabo Delgado, just so uh, we are all on, on the same page. Um, um, and, um, and after that, I will introduce the distinguished panelists. I can also mention that after uh, the first round um, of the panelists, there, or you can just actually just right now start writing questions. Uh, you can write questions in the chat on, uh, on Facebook or on Zoom, and we will read as many questions as possible. Right. Um, as you know, for the last few years, uh, the Cabo Delgado province in northern Mozambique have been terrorized by militants. The start of the problem can be traced back longer, but um, in uh, but a 2017 attack on Musimboa de Praia is often referred to as the beginning of the conflict. Since then, about 700,000 people have been displaced and an estimated 3,000 people have been killed. In March this year, militants stormed the important town Palma, and it took many by surprise uh, how fast this conflict has snowballed into something that the international community no longer can continue to ignore. If you have only read the few headlines written about this conflict in the Norwegian media, the focus has been on Islamist terror and on graphic details of the extreme brutality of the violence. This is part of the picture, uh, but today we will try to dig a bit deeper into this complex and multidimensional crisis. Just a few words about this militant group behind the attacks. It goes by many names. Locally, it's often referred to as Al-Shabaab, uh, but it, there are no links to the jihadist group Al-Shabaab in Somalia. According to a recent international crisis group report, the group or the estimates vary, but the group has somewhere between 1,500 and 4,000 fighters. Most of the fighting youth are locals, uh, but there are also strong indications that at least part of the leadership is from other countries. The Islamic State, ISIS, has on a few occasions claimed ties to the group. Uh, and the US has labeled the group as an ISIS affiliated group. Still, most reports and analysis coming out are clear that the influence and control that ISIS might have seems very weak. And we will hear more about this, but I can, the, yeah, uh, I will, can also say that religion is not the foundation of the local grievances. Um, just a few words also on, on Cabo Delgado, the pro province where the conflict is taking place. Um, as probably most of you know, Mozambique has a very long coastline. Uh, and I did a, a quick search on Google Maps uh, this morning and the distance from Cabo Delgado to Maputo is about the same as from Cabo Delgado to Mogadishu in Somalia. And it is actually longer from, um, um, no, sorry, it's, it, it's the, from Cabo Delgado. The distance to Mogadishu is the same as the distance to the capital of Mozambique, Maputo. It is also longer than, than from Oslo to Hammerfest. I just mentioned this, uh, this point to point out that uh, for the people of Cabo Delgado, and I think the ruling elite in Maputo feels very, very far away. It will also be, we will also talk about how the northern part of Mozambique has historically been marginalized and less developed than the southern part of the country, which is closer to South Africa. 
Um, the coast of Cabo Delgado is also the place where there have been discoveries of some of the largest reserves of natural gas on the African continent. After the recent attacks on Palma, the French company declared force majeure on its multi-billion dollar natural gas project because of insecurity. And the future of Mozambique's gas adventure is right now uncertain. It can also be mentioned that Cabo Delgado, as has been reported in many reports, um, has for long been a corridor of illicit trade, and most importantly, drugs, but also yeah, minerals. And, um, the, um, the response now, uh, are, um, a military response is being discussed many places, including in the uh, the, between the neighboring countries and uh, through the uh, Southern Africa Development Community, uh, SADAC, where they are discussing to send in troops, but, but they have failed to come up with a suggestion that can be accepted by the president of Mozambique. Then I will um, introduce the panelists. Um, first, you will um, you will uh, you will meet Aslak Yangor uh, Orra. He is a senior researcher at Christian Mikkelsen Institute. His work on Mozambique goes back a quarter of a decade to 1996. He was the lead author of the report published three weeks ago by CMI together with SIP, Centro de Integridad Publica, on the cost and consequences of the hidden depth in Mozambique which is a highly recommended read. He was also the co-author of the Mozambique Political Economy Analysis commissioned by Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he is currently the coordinator of a recently established research project on the war in Cabo Delgado, based at CMI and in cooperation with the University of Bergen and, and, and civil society actors in, uh, and, and partners in Mozambique. And then um, you, we, you will meet Kiteria uh, Girengane. She is the president of Mozambique, Mozambican Young Women Leaders Network. She is one of the most prominent young activists in Mozambique. Among other things, she is one of the founders of the Mozambique Youth Parliament, a movement that is still playing an important role in hold, holding politicians accountable. Then you will meet Aber Meser. Uh, she has been working uh, on emergency programming for the last 11 years, years. She is currently the country representative of NRC in the country and the team leader of the NRC Global Emergency Response Team. At the end, you will meet Claudio Feo. He is the regional director for MPA in Southern Africa. Uh, after a few years based in Johannesburg, he has recently moved to Maputo. Uh, Claudio has followed politics in Mozambique, just as long as Aslak, ever since he worked uh, for MPA in the Tet province uh, from 1996. So, and then I will uh, uh, continue and, and ask Aslak to start giving us uh, a short background from a political economy perspective on what do we need to know? What is relevant to know to be able to understand why this insurgency started in Mozambique and in Cabo Delgado and why it has grown in strength? And it's good if you can also just mention, like, what do we know? Who are this? Uh, who, who, who is this behind this group? Thanks. Aslak. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Magnus, for this nice introduction. And thank you to the Norwegian People's Aid. Um, it's always a, it's always um, a pleasure, uh, and I always uh, appreciate the debates that you initiate. Initiate. Now, if you ask an academic to um, answer such complex questions as these, um, then it may take some time. So please bear with me. But I'm I'm hoping to to limit it to a few minutes. Um, but um, let me let me start by. Uh, answering your question with uh, a bird's eye view on the war um, 
uh, which we can now take after a few, um, uh, about almost four years of this war. Um, and also because um, I'm sitting in Norway, I'm doomed to make a bird's eye observation rather than <laughs> an underground observation. I, I haven't been in Cabo Delgado for years. So what I'm saying is basically, uh, is obviously based on, on the material that we get out of, um, of others' observations. Now the bird's eye view, I would start by saying, this war um, started with much hula baloo about the religious extremism of the insurgents and uh, of Islamist terrorism. Yet with the attack on Palma uh, in March and the gas industry, this has also become a war with enormous international repercussions. So the war is perpetrated uh, by insurgents against the state, but the victims are largely local inhabitants. Uh, for instance, the coastal districts of northern Cabo Delgado appear to be nearly empty of people right now. The insurgents um, have not clearly stated their aims, and the government have been incredibly eager to keep foreigners and national observers from reporting from the conflicts, and they have resisting, been resisting any foreign military aid and intervention except for its trusted mercenary grouplets. This all begs the questions what the government forces are um, hiding. All of this uh, bird's eye view paints a rather confusing overall picture. What is going on and what is all this about? So um, my take is that we've, um, the first thing to note about this war is the futility of trying to understand the root cause of the conflict in Cabo Delgado. A real understanding requires some insight into the various root causes as well as the current and emerging driving forces of the war. Once out of the box, the violence and the war creates its own dynamics, changing the character of the conflict. For the record, I do not claim that I understand it fully. The war started in October 2017 when Muslim militants attacked a police station in a rural town in Cabo Delgado. Yet, yet it is more evident that the grudges, the local religious devout youth, uh, because they were local, that the, the grudges they had with the state and local society did not appear from thin air. It had a history that is rooted in cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and political economic amalgamation of populations taking place in Cabo Delgado, sitting at one encounter of the predominantly Muslim world of the East African coast, connected to the Arabic, uh, Arab influence from the North, the European and Christian world and capitalist economy brought by the colonizers and the persisting socioeconomic structures of the various Bantu cultures and ethnic groups inhabiting Cabo Delgado. The Macondas of the interior, the numerous Makua groups and the coastal Mwani and Swahili uh, speaking peoples. Um, not to speak of the influence of the foreigners in business and the many non-local people that the Mozambican state has brought as administrators and workers from parts of Mozambique that are literally thousands of kilometers away, as Magnus said. Cabo Delgado may be remote from Maputo, but it is connected in so many ways to rich traditions of other places through trade, religion, and culture and politics. So hence, I think it's important to sort of uh, speak a little bit against this um, idea of Cabo Del Del Delgado as being some sort of just a mere backwater. So we know that for at least a couple of decades, there had been tensions of religious ideas brew brewing in a place like Musimbo da Praia, pitting fundamentalist youth against the established clergy of the inter uh, about the interpretation of Islam. Evidently, those religious debates were inspired by debates in the wider Muslim world, in particular those pitting Islam against Western influence and secularist capitalism in Africa. Hence, the current craze in parts of Western punditry that the feared Islamic state is now using a local conflict to establish its next caliphate in Southern African nation. Yet, the evidence is sufficient for us to ascertain that the vast majority of the insurgent leaders and soldiers are locally based and the evidence of foreign control is so flimsy that we can largely discard the theory that ISIS is behind it all. Hence, the war cannot be understood by looking at the development of religious ideas and the psychology and the angry religious youth, locally referred to as the Mashababush. 
Alluding to the title of this seminar, religious extremism alone cannot explain the uprising. But the, the other half of the seminar title, that it may be an uprising of the poor against the inequality, and presumably then against the state, have also been an idea with some popularity in Mozambique and in other countries. I suppose that Cabo Delgado has been a province, uh, it, suppose, it supposes that Cabo Delgado has been a province forgotten by the Mozambican state. Yet, even if some of the human development statistics in Cabo Delgado are among the worst of Mozambican provinces, there's no evidence that Cabo Delgado is much worse off than so many other places and provinces in Mozambique. Even though most of state and private investments um, have been taking place in Maputo since the early 1990s. Why then have we not seen the war breaking out in places like Tete, Manica, or Niasi, where also millions of people live in equally desperate conditions? I therefore find also the insurgency against the inequality thesis a bit too simplistic. If that were the case, we'd have war all across Mozambique. It is also based on the presumption that people in Cabo Delgado or Mozambique were more equal in the past, which is debatable when taking a long-term view of the history. Also, there is no evidence that the motives of the first militants were motivated by social criticism of poverty and inequality alone. They shouted about infidels and corruption in Maputo in equal portions. However, what may, be, what may distinguish Cabo Delgado from other provinces is, particular, is the particular configuration of historical patterns of violence tracing back to historic tensions between and within ethnic groups fomented by colonialism, conflicts, and privileges during the war for national liberation, the schisms of the previous war between Renamo and Frelimo, and how it played out in Cabo Delgado, and lastly, but not least, the particularly glaring examples of violence perpetrated by forces involved in the illicit and quasi-illicit natural resource extraction and smuggling of, uh, in the smuggling economy of Cabo Delgado. So the province has seen unre unregulated, unfair, and oppressive exploitation of gold, rubies, other minerals, tropical timber, and fauna, and with it, the unregulated flow of large sums of money and sudden enrichment of a few alongside massive poverty and destitution. The last bit here is corruption and systemic unfairness created by a ruling party, the Frelimo, that has ruled the country for 45 years. It has created the system where the political and economic elite has merged as one. The party uses the state to dish out privileges to its own clients in exchange for political support, fomenting corruption, administrative chaos, and incompetent and uncommitted uh, development efforts, and any true commitment to real development seems relinquished. So in order to sum up all of this, my conclusion is that the conflict can be summed up in what I call the three Gs. The one G is God, the religious ideas that clearly play a role in this conflict. The second G is grievance, the frustration of the oppressed. And, and the last G is greed, the ruthlessness of some trying to make fortunes in a very unregulated political economy. So God, grievance, and greed. Hence, any solution to the conflict will not be simplistic. It will also have to tend to these three problems, the God problem, the grievances of the oppressed, and the greed of unfettered capitalism of the periphery. So this is my introduction to the whole thing. Thank you. I, of course, want to ask many questions immediately, but, but I rather I will move on. Um, and, and, and I will ask you, Teria, um, if you can add on this, what do you see as the core of, 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 this, uh, of this conflict? And, and it would be also good if you can, um, when, you, when you look from, from Maputo about uh, the, in, the international response and the response of the Mozambican government, are they responding to the, to the actual problems? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Mozambique is a very diverse country in terms of culture and rich country in terms of mineral resources. Uh, until 2012, Southern Africa was seen not only as the most pacific region in the continent, but also Mozambique as the most tolerant country in terms of religion in the world. 
We know very little about these insurgents and even information about its origins is dubious given to the communication and propaganda world that has been thriving. Uh, while there are different approaches that lean on one side, uh, I personally do not agree um, with a poorly internal or external root causes. I really understand that there, we need to look to the problem holistically. Understanding terrorism in Cabo Delgado requires an in-depth uh, analysis of the deepest causes of the problem and those interested in, uh, and all the stakeholders that are interested in this situation. As Lack like mentioned, many of the issues that I'm, I'm bringing here, but I try to make this uh, diagram that for me is that we look to terrorism. First, we look the Islamic extremism approach uh, and uh, this Islamic terrorist approach uh, looked to the first signs of Al the local Al Shabaab, as it is called, in 2000, around 2008, 2012, when uh, local young people started to receive some scholarship to study in Sudan, uh, extremism, religion, uh, and also when the first uh, extremist mosques started to, to, ra to raise. But many approaches also understand Islamic extremism as just a coverage, cover to the really issues that is going on in the region. There is also the gas and the legal debts approach that uh, we, not, we don't look only to the fact that Africa loses annually more than $50 billion in the list of capital flows as the Mbeki approach can prove but also the fact that uh, when we look to the, see all the situation of illegal debts, when it started in around 2013, we were told that it was supposed to protect our coasts to assure that we could have a maritime security and uh, a technology to protect, to make sure that the LNG projects can, could have local security. So, but now, uh, uh, um, more than 11 um, processes in London that Mozambique has been responding because of all this situation. We also have the creditors asking for gas dividends to pay for, for, the, for the debt. And uh, one of the situations is that when we look to all this approach, we go to the geopolitical interest also, because we see that all the legal debt started in France. Uh, when in 2013, the President Gebuza and President Francois Hollande met uh, to introduce to Privinvest and uh, show that France was supporting Privinvest to come to invest in Mozambique in the security. Uh, but also we look to France and we see interest in the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is responsible to a of a quarter of the world's economic exchange. We look to the Mozambican coast interest and uh, also the French interest in the mineral deposits. Although France is the champion of the uh, global uh, climatic agreement. Uh, but we also see the back in times, the US naval interest in Nakala as a naval basis. And we see now that Nakala is being set up as the humanitarian basis, but also a base to the response of SADC. Uh, with uh, President Macron now meeting with uh, President Kagame in Rwanda, but also meeting with President Ramaphosa to make sure that SADC approach is um, linked with the French support to the region. But also we see Cap Delgado as a corridor for trafficking. And uh, we look to the world and we see the war, the business, the war of this, the war business. When we look to that, we see that drugs, human and resource trafficking have uh, the Indian Ocean as a corridor. And uh, also, as many reports can show us, mercenaries are regularly cited as violating human rights, attacking entire populations and extracting resources, not only in Congo, but we also have reports about rubies in capital Gadu, about uh, uh, wood disappearing in Mozambique, even when the court decide to, to interrupt this, this practice. So, and we also look that uh, only in this process of legal debts, we had the report from the French parliament that France has sold to Mozambique 12.3 million euros in armaments, 
during this period. But from the other side, when we look to internal um, uh, uh, issues, first, we need to acknowledge that there is also the Cold War in the region. I, I call it Cold War because Mozambique, one of the reasons why Mozambique is resisting to accept uh, the intervention of SADC is the fact that Mozambique really uh, mistrusts Mali has a lot of conflicts with Malawi, with Tanzania, with South Africa. And sometimes Mozambique even says, the government even says that Tanzania is not interested in solving the issue in Mozambique because think that terrorist groups can go to Tanzania, but also because Tanzania has the same interest on the gas deals with Mozambique, although there are some um, uh, approaches that the NICE refuse this, this, this version. But also we have the interest of the defense sector and the officials in Mozambique. When we look to the business of war, we see that during the military tension uh, in Mozambique, in the central region of Mozambique between 2012, 13 and uh, 2019, uh, there were a lot of disappearing of money. For, uh, for example, in 2015, 33 uh, million medical disappeared from the safety of the Ministry of Defense. And uh, also the, now the Germany has just finished it. So, and uh, there, there are some linkages also to the fact that Total has given money to the Ministry of Defense to uh, create a, a operation, um, special operation force to, uh, to protect the LNG gas projects. But this money is no one know the whereabouts of this money. Uh, and the elites in, the, in this area are also profiting with this work. But we also look to the exclusion. That is the political and social systemic inequalities that we have in Mozambique. And this is a, an issue all over the country. But when we look to places like Cap Delgado, uh, the situation is even worse. We don't have only prosecution of human rights defenders, but we also have a situation in which uh, local uh, miners are being tortured, are being taken out their lands, are being, uh, when, the, when the government discovered that a land have something like gas, rubies, they are, are, are invited out of their own lands with all their culture, history, but also they are being arrested because of trying to have benefits of their own resources. And this exclusion is related also to this conflict. And we look, when we look to this exclusion, we go to what I call apartheid. That when we look, for instance, to the Palma attack, we, we see that one of the complaints of the population that were even before the day of the attack, there was a situation in which uh, the terrorist groups has uh, uh, divided the roads between or oh, uh, have been attacking the roads that goes to Palma. So Palma was a kind of a, an island isolated in that place in a way that uh, the markets were not being fit, uh, that uh, people didn't have access to means of survival, but the government was making sure that um, the uh, food for the big hotels, for the corporations uh, and all the mega projects were being sent to many hotels. So this situation created an environment in which it was easier to mobilize local citizens to idea to terrorists because they don't see which dividends are they taking from this development that have been promised to them. And even in, during the rescue of Palma, we could see that many helicopters were only concerned of making sure that the chiefs of the projects, government officials, or those expatriates could go uh, alive, be safe during the rescue. But all those native and local people were left behind. So this also created an environment that if it's not a cause, at least it's an agent that facilitates the integration of the terrorist groups. And we have ethnical tribal conflicts that some studies also look at it because we have Makua, Makondi, and Mwanis uh, different culture uh, tribes uh, with conflicts that we don't, and uh, many times we don't uh, um, um, consider and have a clear study to uh, to know how to deal with that. And uh, the last thing is the 
compulsory, re compulsory resettlement of people. Many people uh, believe that also these uh, terrorist attacks are related to the fact that uh, there are people with interest, that people leave the places where there are mineral resources. For instance, during the one of the attacks near Parma in 2019, there are reports that a construction, a mining constructor LNG project, uh, were um, seen constructing the um, um, the place. Uh, how how do I call the place where the airplanes land? Uh, the helicopters can land. It's aerodrome in Portuguese. Sorry, uh, during the, uh, the 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 time that people left for secure zones, so people came back to their own lands and found out that this company has taken their own lands. So this uh, sort of um, war interest, uh, a war to control resources and to make sure that people leave their own land so that uh, multinational but also the political elites can uh, have their in income from this conflict but most of all the political elites of mozambique that is really corrupt there is really interested on having profits of all this case business without making sure that local citizens can have an income from this we mm. see that many times Government is more concerned on discussing with uh, uh, multinationals the situation of capital guard than informing its own citizen of what is really going on. And we see there is a conflict between wings in the ruling party, the wing from the President Gebuza and the wing from President Nusi. So I think it's really important to, to understand all these root causes, but also to understand that there are uh, facilitating agents as the massive social media propaganda, the mistrust in defense forces, because no one believes, many of the people don't believe in defense forces, because they are many times related to all this approach to violate human rights, the porous borders and corruption that we have in Mozambique, the infiltration in defense forces, the donation theft that we have been watching, the absence of escape assistance, peace without reconciliation. We didn't learn from the lessons from the military tension in the central region um, and hunger, political persecution, and also the guerrilla approach of these groups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kiteria. Thank you, Kiteria. Um, we have to move on, but still I want, I want to ask one follow-up question to you, Kiteria. Uh, because we discussed previously um, how you mentioned that Victims in Cabo Delgado suffer suffer uh, double uh, double violence, um, and how can this be linked to humanitarian assistance? Um, if you, yeah, can you just yes, yes. just uh, uh, yes, shortly on that. <laughs> we can expand later. I used to say that people suffer double violence because um, apart from this exclusion and the apartheid that we can see there. We also see that many people are complaining that when they access to safe zones or to humanitarian camps, they also suffer violence. It's all, from one side, the mistrust uh, of government officials that uh, many times says that many of them are infiltrated, uh, are being infiltrated by terrorist groups, but also the fact that not only women are being kidnapped, violated, but also there are many denounces with evidence that uh, the donation are being, uh, the uh, people are taking their own donations to favor, to, to the favor of elite groups, all for the local community leaders. And many times all these denounces are not being taken seriously in a, in a, in a way that people are even asking for money to enter to safe zones. And also militars are being accused in many times of being stealing the, the 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 things that the population are left behind. So all this situation contributes to a situation in which citizens really don't trust in the militias, but also don't trust in the government approach. And we can see it in the center of strategic studies, uh, strategic and international studies from University of Kinshasa, in the Amnesty International Study, in Unirovuma Studies, in Amigo Statera Studies in OMR studies, in e and even in the parliament reports that have been issued on human rights in capital guard. Thank you so much, Kiteria. 
we will move on to, to Aber. Um, NRC has recently started operations in Cabo Delgado. Uh, so can you briefly just tell us about the humanitarian situation to, today? Uh, and, and, and what can we expect in the months to come? Uh, good morning from Pemba. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so in fact, NRC has been following the crisis in Cabo Delgado since early 2020. I mean, during this time and from outside, the number of IDPs seemed stable. Uh, I mean, requiring a minimum uh, type of response or intervention. Uh, the the uh, funding for the humanitarian response seemed secured for 2020. And there was a, uh, I would say, a bright plan of the, uh, of the authorities to relocate, resettle the number of IDPs in what we call relocation sites. So they will get, the land is, is uh, available. Uh, people will get a plot of land. They can have uh, to build their house, a meshamba uh, for one hectare to grow their plants and be resilient awaiting their return to their uh, areas of origin. But then we have seen a rapid escalation of the conflict. What was first for us as an RC, a short-term intervention where we would go, do emergency response and come back, it turned out to be a more a longer uh, response. So since March 2020, we have seen the number of IDPs increasing drastically from 100,000 IDPs in March 2020, we're now at 780,000 and the number is growing by the day. I mean, in the background of our intervention as humanitarian, we do have a historically neglected uh, province. We have a high number of vulnerable population. We have a very complex ethnic, tribal, political divisions. We have the gas discovery, uh, the presence of non-state armed groups, and of course, the resource sharing. I mean, for, from, our, from our side uh, as NRC, I could speak about the uh, emergency response or what we call the humanitarian response into three aspects. First of all, uh, the, the, uh, what we call the uh, conflict affected population. When we're talking, first we're talking about the IDPs and the host communities. For the IDPs, for us as NRC and many humanitarian agencies, the most, uh, uh, I would say, serious issue is the IDP registration. And this goes back to what Kiteria has been saying. There is no, what we call, a system of IDP registration. We receive the list from the authorities and we have to uh, provide assistance according to these lists. So this implicates that the most vulnerable are not getting the assistance needed at the time needed. So we're talking about registration and targeting. So the targeting is not uh, being implemented the way it should be. The second thing is the uh, where are these IDPs going? We know that 90% of the IDPs are going into host communities. The host communities are very vulnerable. And we know from the authorities, we do not have or we should not provide assistance to the host community. This will, has started to create what we call tensions. We know that there are tensions uh, uh, of resources, tensions around water, uh, uh, tensions around even the lands that are being given. We have incidents, for instance, in Makumia, where IDPs who, that, uh, who fled the Palma took over the houses of IDPs who fled to the southern part of, the, uh, of Cabo Delgado. Uh, the resettlement, the relocation plan is going very slow. I mean, uh, and in this, uh, we should talk about the engagement of uh, the communities. Are we talking to the communities? What are their intentions? Do they intend to return? If they intend to return, we need to engage with them. Do you want to return or do you want to integrate? And if you're talking about integration, we need to know how is this going to happen? Uh, I give you an example. Many of the coastal, uh, historically coastal people were, I mean, sent to the inland and now they are changing their whole mode of livelihoods. 
So fishermen are now turning into uh, agriculture. And this is also creating some uh, issues uh, with regards to voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, sending of people to different uh, uh, places. This is from the what we call the uh, population of concern. If I talk about the presence of humanitarian agencies and our mandate, what we are going to do. Up until now, what we see, there is uh, the, the, the humanitarian agency structure, mandate, why are we in Cabo Delgado, what do we do, is still very vague to authorities. What is our mandate? For them, for the authorities, up until now, we are still seen as service providers. So we come, the authorities tell us what we should do, where to go, who to target, and how to do our uh, emergency assistance. Of course, there are negotiations ongoing, very tedious negotiations on uh, registration, on the mandate, on the structure. Why is uh, targeting very important? Why do we have to go to this area and not this area? How do we select the, the uh, uh, relocation uh, places? This is slow, tedious, but ongoing discussions. For us as humanitarian agencies, the, the, the physical access is difficult. So when I talk to about physical access, Cabo Delgado is, is, a, is a very large province, very, very large province. We're talking about the size of many, many countries. To reach the, the uh, what we call the population, uh, uh, displaced population, the population which is concerned, the roads are not the best. When there's uh, the rainy season, the, the roads are totally cut. So sometimes we are cut off from the, the, the people we're targeting. And the safety, of course, is, is the most concerning aspect. Admin access has been the most challenging. Uh, visa access to humanitarian agency is still very difficult. Uh, um, um, months, we wait months and months to be able to come to Cabo Delgado. Also, the authorities are asking us to come and support the emergency response. Uh, the third point, aside from this, is the humanitarian response itself. I mean, last year we were, uh, I would say, uh, fairly funded. It was because we didn't estimate the number of IDPs. This year, the funding is really low. We're talking about 10% of the requested uh, uh, humanitarian response plan. We're talking about more than $300 million required, and we have a 10% of funding, which is really uh, the division, uh, distribution of resources will be very difficult if we do not go into proper targeting, uh, proper uh, according to needs, and to reaching out to, to the population in need. The response uh, capacity. I mean, historically, uh, Cabo Delgado, uh, is uh, has been we have many international NGOs these international NGOs came after the uh, uh, natural disasters small NGOs working in development long time a small response capacity Ca suddenly there is a very large crisis complex crisis with many uh, impacts specifically on safety so if you are a small international NGO with no safety, uh, I would say, uh, backup, you cannot go immediately to what we call hard to reach areas. You cannot go to the population most in need because you need to be prepared. You will not put yourself at risk. You don't have the resources to do so. So these international NGOs are trying to adapt to a complex emergency. Thus, they are stuck in the southern part of, of uh, the Cabo Delgado. We see more international NGOs in what we call the lower lines, the red lines, where the access is possible, less international NGOs in the northern part, where the access is more or less, uh, I would say, medium, but difficult. So, uh, and the, in all of this, we do have the national NGOs, national NGOs that have not been capacitated for, for different reasons. Of course, we do want to work with inter, uh, national NGOs. However, we cannot just put a high risk on the national NGOs because they can go. We need to capacity build them, to train them on safety. Uh, I mean, all the governance behind it, the financial reporting, etc., to be able to support and go and intervene because at the end, we need to hand over. We're not staying here forever, hopefully. I mean, for me, the months to come are uh, Yes, the must to come are, are 
Yeah. yeah, no, just I have to ask you to be very, very brief on that one. I yes. see that. Very wants to come more hardship, uh, economic hardship, because of uh, the oil and gas uh, leaving many people out of work. Uh, more hardship because many businesses are closing. The security is unpredictable. The one positive thing, we, we have more international NGOs with the know-how to deal with complex emergencies. And uh, thank, thank you. you. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abed. Um, even though time is running, I want to ask you one question, uh, just because um, with your experience from, from, from some of the biggest crises, from Syria to DRC, uh, um, and, and if you look at lessons learned from Sahel, North Nigeria, Somalia, how a security first approach to, to so, somehow similar context has led to important protection concern, human rights violations, and humanitarian access constraints. Um, what are the, I know it's uh, two big questions for such a short time, but, but what are some of the risks for the affected population if this should happen? I mean, uh, clearly it would affect uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, the conflict affected population. The security risk for sure, it will affect first and foremost the, the, the uh, uh, people impacted by the, by the response. Uh, the human we need to have uh, what we call uh, very good humanitarian uh, imperative. Uh, uh, impunity has to be very well uh, uh, tracked, uh, and we do have. Uh, we need to track the humanitarian or human rights uh, violation. I mean, the effect will be the access to assistance because if we filter through the security first approach the people will be really excluded from assistance. The modalities of assistance will be also impacted because we know that the authorities will impose on the humanitarian agencies what kind of assistance, the modality of assistance because of security. So they would tell you, no, you cannot use this modality because I give you an example, the M-Pesa, which is a phone transfer modality, is not very favored by, by, uh, by authorities because they say, through MPESA, there were uh, recruitment of non-state armed groups. So this modality, which is gives more uh, independence to uh, population of concern, they can take the money, use what uh, they, they, it's the most, uh, I would say, transparent and allows people to choose their assistance is not allowed. Uh, more uh, humanitarian right abuse, I would say, if, if we go into this, and it will exacerbate the hostility already present between the, the authorities, uh, I mean, the, the uh, security forces coming from the south to Cabo Delgado and the population. So in fact, in, um, instead of giving a good uh, impact, it will uh, have a backlash and impact uh, further wrongly the, the, the assistance. Uh, this is what I can say for, for this. Thank you so much, Abel. We have to move on to Claudio. Um, Claudio, uh, MPA has worked in Cabo Delgado, supporting local organizations there since, I believe, 2010. Um, yeah, I give the word to you. Um, how, how, how do you see the situation? And if you can say something about how both local civil society and international organizations can play a role, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the panelists that preceded me, first of all. I uh, must warn you that we have a bit of a, an unstable internet in these parts of Maputo this morning, so I apologize for an interruption that might happen. Um, as you said, we've been working in Cabo Delgado. We've been working in Mozambique since 1988 uh, and in Cabo Delgado since 2010 uh, in cooperation with two uh, uh, well-based, uh, rooted local organizations, the Union of Small uh, Farmers, Provincial Union of Small Farmers, and uh, the and Muleida, one of the biggest women organizations in, uh, in Mozambique. Uh, before I, I get there, on, uh, I, I would like to make a couple of comments on, on what was said uh, uh, before. Um, the uh, I think I think one of, it's impossible to find one root cause of a conflict, uh, and uh, the, the, the many they sum up the, the conflicting causes. 
certainly there's been a disruption of the social and political pact between the liberation movement and the population in Mozambique. Uh, this is not uh, uh, typical of Mozambique. This is has happened in Zimbabwe, to mention a neighbor, a neighbor country. And unfortunately, it's going to happen in, uh, uh, in South Africa. We've seen signs of it in, in South Africa. Uh, uh, the, uh, what, what's happening in, in, in Cabo Delgado is that uh, I think the trust of the population uh, uh, has uh, collapsed. Um, uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, Arslak mentioned uh, uh, why has this not happened in other parts of, of Mozambique. That trust has collapsed also in other parts of Mozambique. Uh, the uh, the uh, Mozambique has about 80% of its population that is relying on rural economies and on sustainable agriculture. Also, the urbanized population of Mozambique, strong roots in the countryside, has strong roots in their mashambas. Uh, uh, the, this has been marginalized. This economy has been marginalized by the imposition of big. Uh, mega projects, as they call them in uh, in uh, in Mozambique, uh, on um, and on an extractive economy. I will uh, uh, return on that because it has relevance on the future of Cabo Delgado. Mozambique has also been uh, sort of identified in the uh, early 2000s as a sort of new Botswana, uh, the the uh, growing economy, growing macro figures and big investments coming in and a mecca for the trickle down uh, theorists. Uh, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the big investments, the only thing that they've done was to consolidate uh, an elite, uh, which holds both political and economic power at the moment as it was signed. Uh, now, uh, these, uh, uh, all the observers at the moment look at the long haul uh, crisis. It's a long haul crisis which uh, which hits a country and an area, Cabo Delgado, which is a multiple shock area. Uh, we're talking about the, the military conflict, which is obvious. We're talking about the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, emergency, and we're talking about a number of micro and uh, macro um, environmental generated uh, uh, crisis. I mean, since I've been working with Mozambique in 96, I've always been dealing with a drought, with a flood, uh, now recently with cyclones, uh, and more apparently are to come. So what we're talking about is, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is a multiple shock. The multiple shock in a way is reflected in some of the the, the obstacles that were mentioned by, uh, by Abir uh, on, uh, on the delivery of humanitarian aid, where, for instance, there is a backlog of Kenneth victims, cyclone Kenneth victims, which the local authorities are trying to deal with. And then, of course, they see resources which are allocated to the this place, to the military conflict, which institutionally cannot be used or easily used for victims of other conflicts. And then you, know, then you get into a circle which requires a different thinking of humanitarian aid, requires a different level of flexibility and a different level of accountability. Uh, not the accountability towards the administration of, of, of aid, but the accountability towards the beneficiaries. Uh, back to the conflict. Uh, in, um, uh, I, uh, when the second big flood of IDPs came in, um, the uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, uh, I looked at the figures, at uh, the census figure for figures from 2017 on the eight districts which are most affected, effect, mostly affected by the conflict at the moment. Uh, if we count the IDPs and the figures of the census in 2017, we see that about 70% of the population has become IDP. Now, the, if we put this kind of disinformation together with the quickness, the very quick response from the government in 
uh, uh, saying that the IDPs have to stay and to be relocated in, uh, in uh, areas of relocation uh, in the, uh, where they've uh, reached now. We can, uh, we can, we might think, we might think that there is an interest in cleansing northern Mozambique, reducing the presence of civilian population in northern Mozambique, and create a sort of, uh, special economic zone for any kind of trade and exploitation uh, uh, of, of natural resources. This is, I mean, it's 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 a theory. It's a theory. It's uh, pretty uh, spread. Uh, when we talk to uh, Mozambican uh, colleagues and, uh, um, uh, and researchers, but uh, it is something to take into account uh, when we think of the reasons of the conflict and when we think of the kind of response which is required in the southern part of the province, uh, which is uh, now receiving, uh, receiving IDPs. It's a long-term response. Mm. We have to go for we we have to set for the long haul. It's a long term response which requires also a strong engagement of local population, mm. local local population, local I communities. I have to ask you to round off if you have any last points. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have. Uh, I'm. I'm really sorry. I'm, I, it's difficult to balance. I just came back from Pemba, so it's, it's a bit difficult to balance uh, with the emotions as well. Uh, but. Uh, so long haul uh, response, uh, engagement of local communities, the engagement of local communities has an impact on governance. Mm. Engagement of local communities and local civil society means also a different dialogue with the local government and rebuilding a social and political fabric, which is essential for any peace agreement, uh, any, uh, re any settlement, peaceful settlement, uh, that we wish to be sustainable. Local governance means local civil society and local communities. One more thing, very last one. There is a strong discussion, a uh, very wide discussion on the... I lost him. Uh, I know you really want to make this point, but I'm moving on to Katrina Andersen. Oh. Sorry, Claudio. We lost you. We lost you. Um, so we have also asked the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, to comment on the situation. Uh, and we have Katrine Andersen here. Uh, she is the special representative uh, on protection uh, for the NMFA. So listening to this debate, can you, yeah, can you please comment? And, and, and uh, is there anything, yeah, what's the role of Norway and in the international community here? Thanks. Thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you to the to the presenters. I think it's you've laid out exactly both um, how uh, complex this uh, this current situation is for the population in uh, in the region, uh, but also how this has uh, uh, long threads uh, to the past, but also demands a very complex uh, response for the future. And um, uh, I represent the humanitarian section. And uh, uh, one of the uh, new things for us is that we have made Mozambique a priority, uh, priority country for support from the humanitarian budget for 2021. And um, this building of a, a principled uh, humanitarian response is really key, I think. And some of the challenges have been laid out by by uh, NRC and others in terms of having this independent, impartial and, uh, and, um, and principled humanitarian response, engaging with the local population um, to, to, uh, to build that, uh, that response to uh, a new situation which has a higher level of, of violence and, and conflict than let's say the natural disaster approach that some of the organizations have had previously. Um, secondly, I think the political dialogue that we try to maintain with the, with the government and other uh, countries in the region and also globally is important. Of course, this is a situation that needs political uh, development and uh, uh, solutions, uh, but it's also many global processes that where we are engaged that 
that is relevant for Mozambique. I think the illicit uh, trade uh, was uh, discussed, uh, trafficking, um, um, the human rights situation, human rights defenders, and so on. That is also relevant um, uh, for for the region. We have our seat in the Security Council. Just to say two words about that. The uh, there has been uh, discussions whether Mozambique could be, is there anything that the Security Council could do? Uh, so far, there has been no agreement to discuss um, the issue in that format within the Security Council. I think it's seen that SADC must sort of take the lead here, and um, but we will continue to seek opportunities to, to, discuss, um, to discuss the situation in Mozambique. And uh, as uh, chair of the working group on children and armed conflict, it's really also uh, a situation that we are following very closely. So <laughs> given the time limits here, I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Katrina. And um, thank you to all of you. Uh, it's, we knew it was ambitious to try to, to have this discussion in one hour, um, but we actually have to round off. There is no time for questions, but what we will do is to, to take uh, try to answer the questions in the chat on Facebook. And uh, I can't promise anything, but I also will ask some of the panelists to, to see if, if, if you can also respond in the chat. Um, so on that note, I just have to, to, to thank everyone, uh, thank the panelists and uh, thank NRC for, for the very good cooperation. And thanks to everyone listening. And there are so many questions I want to ask, so I definitely think we will consider to have another one. And have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.